apologies for that. Heavenly Father and Lord God, as we come before thee this evening, we are thankful that we are able to come into the presence of our Lord and our God once more. We thank thee that we can do this through thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We do praise thee, Lord God, for the salvation which thou hast bestowed upon us. We recognize it is something which we have not merited or earned in any way, but has been graciously given. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to benefit from this time together, help us to think on the mystery of our Lord Jesus Christ and his person. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I would like to start by reading from the Word of God, and it's just a number of very short readings. I'm going to go to the opening verses of Genesis, which we should all be familiar with from our recent studies in church on Sunday morning, and then we will turn to the Gospel of John and then to Hebrews. So that's uh, the direction in which we'll go. Genesis 1 to start with. Verses 1 through to verse 4. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Now, we could have kept reading through Genesis, but have chosen to stop reading at that point. John, John chapter 1, 1 through to verse 4 as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. And verse 14 of the same chapter reads, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Finally, turn into Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll read verse 10 and 14. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing in many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Athanasius suffered for the incarnation. He suffered because he thought it was important to maintain that Jesus is God. He saw clearly that any attempt to make Jesus less than eternal God was heresy that undermined the church and undermined our hope. We may instinctively realize that the incarnation is important today. We all express our belief that Jesus is both man and God. But maybe times when we don't fully grasp the reasons for its absolute importance. This reason, this evening, we are going to explore some of those reasons. Athanasius um, saw why it was important, as I said, and in his book, he's got a little book called On the Incarnation, and I've used that this evening for many of the ideas that we're going to look at. At times I will quote him or more often paraphrase him. Although to make the talk flow, I won't say when I'm quoting from him. The book appears to be written before the controversy that Athanasius had to face for most of his life. 
It was written before all that blew up. But it does show us why the incarnation is so important, a teaching for us to hold on to and believe. I just used the expression, the incarnation had to happen, but that can be misunderstood. Um, when I say that, I do not mean that God was indebted in such a way to his creation, to man, that he had to do something, and that something involved a mystery of the incarnation. The reason for the incarnation can only be found really in God himself. God in no way is in our debts. God was not obliged by something outside himself to act in a particular way. What God did in the incarnation, he did freely. And in doing it, he acted in a way that was consistent with who he was, was consistent with his very being. So I don't want to labor that point, though, tonight, but I rather want to think about why the incarnation happens. So let us start with the why of the incarnation. Why did the incarnation take place? The answer could be given in one short sentence. The eternal word of the Father, as of the loving kindness and goodness of his own Father, been manifested in the body for our salvation. Quite simply, the incarnation is all about our salvation. But our, that answer really begs the question, why does our salvation require the incarnation? Could not God have said something like this, or done something like this, utter a decree that he forgives us, just simply say the words, I forgive you, God spoke creation into being. Could God not have just spoken our salvation into being and our recreation into being as well? Well, we need to go back and think a little bit about what God did first at creation. And that's where we're going to start. On well, Sunday mornings, we have looked at those early chapters of Genesis, and I'm sure you now understand why they're so foundational to our faith. Athanasius also understood that creation was foundational and is foundational to our thinking about the incarnation. Let you, me remind you of what we've recently read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is creation out of nothing, ex nihilo, if you want to sound posh. God brings matter into existence from nothing. Now that actually, even in Plato's time, uh, sorry, that even in Athanasius's time would have grated against the kind of common uh, ideas that would have been found. The renowned philosopher Plato had much earlier argued that, uh, that God had made the world out of pre-existent matter. The Bible tells us that God brought matter into being to start with. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear basically means God made things out of nothing. <clears throat> the verse indicates the world to be made out of nothing by the word of God. And that word, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the first verses of John's gospel identifies the word of God with God. The creation of the world was a staged process, if you remember. First, we have the creation of matter out of nothing by God's command. To start with, matter was with then without form. So God made this formless matter. Form was not there. It was void. The matter is shaped further by God into the world in which we stand in today. And it was shaped into that form over a period of six days. And that further shaping of the world was brought about by God speaking. 
that remind you of the words that constantly are recited in those first six days. God said, let there be. And there was. Each day. In other words, God breathes forth his word and shapes matter into the creation that we now experience. In the very opening verses of the Bible, you have the Trinity with God's creative word central. Did you not notice the Trinity when we spoke a few moments ago? God breathing forth his word. God the Father breathing. Think of the breath of God, the spirit of God, and the word, Jesus. Same person of the Trinity. The pinnacle of God's creative work, as we have already seen from our studies in Genesis, was man. You might wonder why should man be considered to be the pinnacle, the high point of God's creative act. Modern science, of course, puts a little space between us and animals. We are just, according to evolutionary science, highly evolved animals. There's just a straight line between us and other animals. We're just a little bit higher up the tree. But the Bible informs us that God takes man, who granted us a body like animals, but makes us radically different to animals by forming in us God's image. It's a radical difference. Stamped onto man's nature is ability to think is knowledge, true righteousness, and holiness. The image of God stamped upon Adam. However, as we have recently seen, man was not able to keep that position when the temptation of the evil one rebelled against God, losing that true righteousness and holiness, and also suffering serious uh, damage to his ability to think bear in mind that the fool says there is no god atheism is not only the product of the corrupt mind that we all inherit from adam it's also a sign that we have lost that first clear view of god in the world around us we can't think straight even about the world and what it tells us about god this rebellion by Adam, which daily leads to fresh outbreaks of sin in his offspring, brings us all, all mankind, under the condemnation of God. Now, why remind you of all of this? We've studied it recently. Well, to make clear that this salvation is impossible by the word of command. God had laid a law down, a just and good law. We've recently studied that too, haven't we? That sin is punished with death. Remember those words God uttered to Adam. The day you shall eat of it, you shall die. Now let me try to put this reverently, although speaking as a man. That creates a problem for God. God has said that sin requires death. So what? Can he just go along and now and annul that good and just commandment and say, well, Death no longer follows sin. But that is what will happen if God simply says, I know that you have sinned, but I forgive you. All I require is repentance. God can't even get around the good and just law in saying, if you repent, I will forgive you. That will require God to turn a blind eye to our past sin, which still stands. And God will need to repeal his good law a law demanded by his own holiness if he simply speaks forgiveness. In this situation, to paraphrase Athanasius, simply to accept repentance would fail to guard the just claim of God. For God no longer would no longer be true if men did not remain in the grasp of death. Repentance does not blot out the sin committed, and that sin has still got to be dealt with. And there is another problem here for God that Athanasius points out. Repentance merely stays 
uh, you mean stops by that word in this context it stays men from the acts of sin it does not get them back to where adam once stood that first sin has resulted in a corruption of human nature no amount of repentance can undo this corruption and restore that original image this means that god cannot send a word of forgiveness from heaven the second person of the trinity cannot bring to us forgiveness in the same way that he created god cannot undo the rebellion of man by breathing a word of forgiveness what god needs to do is far deeper according to athanasius quite rightly according to athanasius i should say god needs to do two things in order to save us bring what is now corrupt to incorruption and he needs to maintain intact the just claim of the father upon all the father has passed that law of death so these two problems need to be kept in mind as we progress to see why the incarnation is so important the word would need to become flesh to solve this otherwise intractable problem Jesus Christ being the word of the Father, and above all, he alone was both able to recreate everything and worthy to suffer on behalf of all and be ambassador for all with the Father. I'm quoting Athanasius there. In other words, only the word of God incarnate was able to recreate us. We need renewing. The image needs to be restored so as to bring incorruption out of corruption. Our bodies, just look around at each other, our bodies are decaying. And he alone, as the word of God alone, is able to say, suffer on our behalf. Thus, what we have, instead of God speaking forth his word, we have God sending forth his word among us god doesn't speak his word he sends his word among us that's the difference between creation and what is now needed you must understand that the word perceived that no other way was possible that the corruption of men could be undone except by death as a necessary condition However, it was impossible. It's impossible for the eternal word of God to suffer. The second person of the Trinity can't suffer. He's more immortal and he's the son of the father. So in order for God to enter into creation, the word had to take on flesh. He had to become united to us. So he takes upon himself a body capable of death. And that body, by partaking of the eternal word, who is above all, but in the body, he might be worthy to die in the stead of all. Jesus Christ had to be the God who shaped creation, but he also had to be the man so that he could die. The unchangeable, infinite and eternal God, the one who was there creating in the very beginning, needed to enter his creation himself. So we have in the incarnation, the incorporeal without body and incorruptible and immaterial word of God come into our realm, howbeit, and this is a mystery, while coming as a man, he was still not far away from any one of us, even at that point. <clears throat> For even in the incarnation, no part of creation was left void of him. God was, the word of God was still upholding all of the creation, yet still coming to us in the incarnation, incarnation at the same time. What God is doing is showing his condensation. Condensation. <laughs> you say that. 
condescension and shown his loving kindness to us by visiting us. The word of God, seeing our race perish with death, reigning over us by corruption, and seeing that we were all under the penalty of death, he took pity on us. And he had mercy on our infirmity, and he came down to our corruption, and unable to bear that death, should have it mastery over us, takes himself a body, and that of no different sort to ours. And thus taking a body of a nature like our own, because we were all under the penalty of the corruption of death, he then gives that body over the death in the place of us and offered it to the Father. He did this out of loving kindness to the end that the law involved in the ruin of men might be undone. And also, secondly, that he might turn man again towards incorruption and quicken them from death. So he deals with the law that was against us, but he also deals with the problem that we've got internally, our corruption, turns us to incorruption, and he quickens us from death, so that by the grace of the resurrection, he might banish death from us like straw from the fire. Not only this, but the body of our Saviour, while in death, needed to remain but incorruptible. Our Saviour's body didn't decay when it lay in that tomb for three days. That could only happen if the eternal word dwelt, indwelt it. And moreover, the corruption of death had to be completely banished. How was that to happen? But it only could happen if that body was raised back to life and we have the resurrection. In the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the hope ourselves of also being clothed with incorruption. The resurrection was absolutely essential if we were to have that hope. So we have the word of God offering his own temple, that's his body, that the debt we were under might be satisfied and that we joined to him might be clothed with incorruption, that is, by the promise of his resurrection. So God deals with those two problems by the word coming down among us. You know, what cost? Athanasius also gives another reason why the word had to come down among us. And that reason has to do with knowing God. When God first made man in his own image, as a, a rational being, a person that could think in true, holiness, in true knowledge, righteousness and holiness, man was able to know God. Adam was able, as we have read, uh, seen on Sunday mornings, able to have fellowship with God in the garden. He could speak with God. And he was also able to see clearly the marks of God's creative word in the world around him. However, this communion with God was broken by the fall. And ever since men in their perversity have so utterly rejected God as not only to forget the idea of God, but also fashion themselves one invention after another. Early man, man up to not long ago, and men in some parts of the world today, fashioned for themselves idols making what are no more than devils their God. No doubt if Athanasius was able to comment on our society, he would see even clearer demonstration of human perversity in the proclamation, there is no God. Athanasius' observations of man's rebellion still ring true today. Everything, he says, was full of irreligion and lawlessness, and God alone and his word was unknown albeit he had not hidden himself from men. You see, creation still clearly teaches it as a maker, but men tend to hide that. The Lord did not leave men 
So he sent among men his law and his prophets. Think of the Old Testament, how he sent the prophets out among his people. Yet even to those whom those words came, rejected the prophets. What was God to do to restore man? His providence and the prophets having been rejected, the word of God came in his own person. That as he was the image of God, a true image, he might be able to create a fresh man after his own image. So again, we have a reason, don't we, why the word takes a mortal body. That death having been done away once and for all, men made after his image might be renewed. None was none other was sufficient for this work save he who is the true image of God. Think of a portrait. The portrait has been effaced, it's been damaged, and it's got to be restored from the original. Jesus Christ is the original image of God, the true image of God. He needed to come in order that that image could be restored to mankind. No other way was possible. Blinded men could not see to be healed. The witness of creation had failed to preserve him and certainly would not bring him back. The word alone could do that, but how? Only by revealing himself as a man. So the word takes to himself a body like others and teaches us by works performed in this body so that we would know him. Not only know him in his providence and rule, but we would know him in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can see what he has done. Think of the Gospels and how they record the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who clearly is the true image of the Father. In short, to know the Father who created the world by his word, we must know the word who walked among us as a man. We can only know God through the word made flesh. Jesus Christ came among us with the task of saving that which is lost, of restoring the true knowledge of God, we ourselves need to look to Jesus Christ and recognize that in him we meet the one who framed the very heavens and earth. So when someone comes to you and demands that God should simply forgive and express, uh, accept the expression of regret, that forgiveness is an easy matter and that every way should get us back to God then you can explain that God was unable to do this. God, who is good, just and holy, cannot do otherwise and punish with death those who sin, according to that law he gave. And no expression of regret can ever erase what we have done. Likewise, corruption has unleashed itself on the human race, and this cannot be fixed by words alone even by God's words alone. Christianity is not simply one of many possible ways back to God. In Jesus Christ, we have the merciful God doing what otherwise would have been impossible. He has done this not by simply speaking forth the word of forgiveness, but by sending forth his word, his son, into the world and that is what makes christianity unique our lord jesus in his body suffering and the resurrection of that body has made possible forgiveness he alone has dealt with the incorruption thrust upon the human race in jesus christ we clearly see the eternal son of the father he is the one, he is the one alone who can restore that image in us. Let us not cast such a great salvation aside, but rather let us live thankfully before God for his unspeakable 
gift. Shall we turn to God and pray for a moment? Heavenly Father and Lord God, as we come before thee this evening, we have been made mindful of that unspeakable gift that thou, Lord God, not only spoke the word into the world into existence by thy word, but Lord God, you have sent forth thy word into this world. And not only just Lord God sent him into this world, but sent him into this world to suffer. We know that the captain of our salvation was perfected through sufferings. And we know, Lord God, that it was fit that he who came to save men should be should share in our flesh and blood. We thank thee that we have a saviour who is able to save us to the uttermost. We thank thee, Lord God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do pray that we could hold on to him. We pray that this Lord Jesus Christ could be magnified in our day and age. That you'd be magnified in our lives and you would be magnified in our church and that he would be magnified even, Lord God, we pray that in, in the society in we live, we pray in short that his kingdom would come. It would come to us individually, but Lord, it would come, Lord God, to us as a church and Lord that that kingdom would grow that is our prayer forgive us we pray for our many sins as we come before thee for we are all sinners mm -hmm. we all know that corruption internally but we thank thee that the day will come when we will lay off the corruption and take on incorruption and we look forward Lord God to our resurrection in that last day help us to live in hope we pray before thee in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.